The past couple of lectures have been a little bit less than thrilling because we've been kind of muddling our way through definitions and theory, but today uh, we get to actually talk about calculating and solving real systems, which is a good change of pace. I've posted the homework. Uh, it's predominantly uh, ideal vapor liquid equilibrium calculation. So for many of you who have a chemical engineering background, it should be, I would think, relatively straightforward. Um, we'll do a little bit of non-ideal vapor liquid equilibrium, and then over the course of the next couple of homeworks, it'll be increasingly more non-ideal. Uh, <clears throat> in the homework, I also included what I call optional problems. So I really am not going to grade these at all, but I can kind of talk you through um, if I look at the solutions, I can kind of talk you through a little bit. But basically, there are problems that I think are asking similar concepts to the ones that are assigned, which are going to be what I'm going to be borrowing from to write homework problems, or write exam problems, rather. So those are intended to give you a little bit extra practice. Um, and I can, of course, give you the answers for any of those ones so that uh, you can double check your work. But I had a lot of individuals requesting additional example problems. The example problems in the book are probably going to be your, one of your best starting points because they walk you through it step by step in as clear of a way as uh, basically Sandler can walk you through it. But then that's, I guess, the next best thing is, is problems that I think highlight key concepts. So that's what those ones are. So if you don't want to do them, you don't have to do them. If you want a little extra practice, you can do them then. Save for the, right before the exam and then do those ones at that time. Whichever you'd like to do, they're just problems that I've looked through uh, and then I think they test similar concepts to what I think are important. All right. Vapor liquid equilibrium. I will oftentimes just write V L E as opposed to writing out the nice big long expression. <clears throat> Okay, what is our starting point for vapor liquid equilibrium? What is my master equation I'm trying to solve? Routes law. Routes law eventually, but assumption free, a hundred percent assumption free. What is my starting point? Fugacities. Fugacities. It is that the partial fugacities of the liquid is equal to the partial fugacity of the vapor for every species. So if I have a ten-component system. I need to solve this equation 10 times. Now the fugacity for every single one of these is going to be a function of the temperature, the pressure, and the composition. So if I have a 10 component system, that means every partial fugacity in every single phase is a function of the temperature, pressure, and all 10 compositions. So this is a completely connected system. Now our goal in phase equilibrium, for the most part, is that we want to be able to find liquid compositions, vapor compositions, or in some circumstances, like let's say for example in an environmental regulation, you may have a criteria of what can be released of some volatile chemical that you know what its mole fraction is, or maybe you're releasing a, a liquid contaminant into a river or a stream, there's going to be some environmental regulation of what the minimum limit of that has to be. So sometimes you may actually be solving for the temperature, pressure, or other conditions to satisfy that the compositions are going to be okay environmentally. For the most part, we're going to be giving you the temperature and pressure and solving for the compositions. And that way that's called a flash calculation, right, where you're basically trying to figure out the amount of each phase and uh, the composition, and rather, two more here, we could have the mass of the liquid and the mass of the vapor. So that's our ultimate goal. We're starting off with this abstract concept of partial fugacities, and we're trying to get to the point where we know the temperature, pressure, and compositions, and the total amount of each of the two phases. To accomplish this, we have a couple of strategies. <coughs> the Sandler book talks about the Fee, fee method. In this case here, these are fugacity coefficients. So the idea would be that if we have an equation of state, we can just directly calculate the partial fugacity coefficient. 
exactly the same expression for the vapor, but just slightly different nomenclature. In which case, the partial fugacity coefficient is just extracted directly from an equation of state. this equation once for a particular compound, you can just use it again and again and again. <coughs> so by evaluating this expression, the hardest term here to, to understand is the change in pressure with respect to N, this has an Ni. So this is something we've seen many times before. Within this pressure expression, that's your equation of state, and from there, You'll have mixing rules where you have to calculate excluded volume of mixing or the interaction parameter of mixing or your eccentric factor of mixing. All of these different concepts and terms get lumped into here. Problem is, <clears throat> we don't have a good enough equation of state that is universally applicable in order for us to apply this more so for the liquid phase. If you did, we could just grab the Peng Robinson equation of state and solve all of our phase equilibrium problems with about the same level of difficulty, a little bit more difficult than what it took to do that big long calculation where we had to calculate the phase diagram and the, and the steam tables for the, for the ammonia system, right? But in theory, we could do that. And someone who's really good at sort of numerical methods and programming could whip up some pretty generalizable code pretty quickly, and that's what Aspen basically is, or any flow simulator system. There has been one class of equations of state uh, called, uh, called a cubic plus association equations of state that tries to get it to be the best of both worlds, where you added an extra term for the excess Gibbs. Uh, but that's something that came about within the last maybe 20 years or so. Now, another approach called the gamma phi method is what most everyone uses. This is where we use an activity coefficient and then a fugacity co coefficient from either correlations or an equation of state. The equations of state are not too bad for gases or vapors. For liquids, that's where we need a little extra help. So this new class of equations of state called cubic plus association is basically trying to incorporate the concept of an activity coefficient into an equation of state. In practice, it really just means you've got a lot more tunable parameters. Oh, one other thing I wanted to note here is just to remind ourselves the definition. Partial fugacity coefficient <clears throat> It's really kind of a roundabout way of doing things because if you just were to substitute it in you would just cancel out and it would just be the partial fugacity. But the notion behind this is you can build correlations so that this is something you look up and then everything else is relatively easy to calculate. So again it's just a convention but this is the partial fugacity coefficient. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this approach, we approximate the fugacity coefficient of the liquid constitutes a non-ideal mixture, 
and these terms capture pure fluid. And this is going to be for a low pressure situation. We're neglecting the pointing correction, right? Because the uh, we're looking at the saturated conditions. So if you have a really, really compressed liquid, then you'd have to add in this pointing correction. This wouldn't be the saturated conditions. It would be a little bit more different. And again, another definition reminder, the fugacity coefficient with no overbar is just equal to the fugacity divided by the system pressure. Fugacity coefficient, partial fugacity coefficient. Just definitions. There's lots of different ways we can write these out, too. So, if we put this all together, we can start to whittle it down. here for right now. This is more or less assumption free. On the vapor side, if we assume ideal mixing, that means we can invoke the Lewis Randall rule, where we can approximate the partial fugacity of the vapor. As the mole fraction times by the fugacity. <laughs> the only reason why I'm not sort of copying this over here because it, it kind of takes the fun out of the approximations. We're going to whittle this down to get a Rouse law. But if we say it's an ideal gas, then this just automatically goes to one. It's not a, not a particularly fun exercise. <clears throat> Okay, so this starting point here is assumption-free, 100% assumption-free. It applies for all phases, all compounds, all everything, all mixtures. This one over here is basically the same thing, no assumptions other than low pressure, I guess. So I guess we're saying it's low pressure to go here. Relatively low, enough to neglect the pointing correction. So we want to take this expression and we want to go through down our approximations till eventually we end up at Routes law. So let's start on the vapor side. What's one more approximation that we can do? Right now we've said it's an ideal mixture, meaning that the volumes of the two gases are additive, which allows us to get this information here for the partial fugacity. What's one more approximation we can do on the vapor phase? There's basically only one more we can do. Ideal gas. Ideal gas. So if we say this is an ideal gas, that means that the fugacity is equal to the pressure for a pure species, no overbars. Likewise, if we still assume that this is an ideal gas, what changes on the liquid side? Bingo. So now this is an ideal gas. That means that our saturated fugacity coefficient is equal to 1. That's because the fugacity of the liquid that is saturated is equal to the fugacity of the vapor that is saturated, which is equal to the system pressure. The fugacity coefficient is equal to the fugacity over the pressure, which is equal to 1. <coughs> 
<coughs> so then we can rewrite this x i cap i i fat. Now what's the last approximation we have to use to get ourselves to Routes Law? One term away from Routes Law. Right, so what is the assumption that we're invoking when the activity coefficient is equal to one? Ideal liquid mixing. So next, last step is ideal liquid mixing. That means that our activity coefficient is equal to one. And we have Routes Law. Now remember, the activity coefficient is defined based on the partial excess Gibbs free energy. So if the excess Gibbs free energy is equal to zero, so if, if it's an ideal mixture, partial excess Gibbs is equal to zero. So that means, what is the, let's see, Gamma is equal to EXP of excess Gibbs over RT, which is equal to EXP of zero, which is equal to one. Now we can jump off of this series of approximations at any point. It all depends on how much do we trust our approximations, how complicated is the system, and how much detail do I need? So if I am a chemical company and I'm about to invest in a multi-billion dollar plant, I would much rather not trust Routes Law, and I will pay the probably $100,000 that it takes to have a thermal fluid lab actually measure all of these properties. Right? And so the libraries of Dow and DuPont and Exxon and Chevron and any chemical company is probably Fast, way more than it's accessible in the public literature. People basically stopped measuring these terms in, I don't know, maybe the 1970s. Right? That's when thermodynamics was pretty well set up for phase fluid phase equilibrium. Uh, so now I think a lot of the any progress is in sort of esoteric chemicals, polymers, really complex, really specialty things. But I bet the libraries of these chemical companies are huge with all the data that they have. All right, so now we're at this point right here. We've got a few more things to tweak about a little, talk about a little bit, uh, but for the most part, this is where we're going to be applying a lot of our time on homework, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But what I first want to talk about is <clears throat> vapor-liquid equilibrium is what we call a non-simple mixture. So first, let's start off with simple mixtures. Now, a simple mixture would be a liquid-liquid system. Basically, pure fluids a simple mixture is where we have the pure fluid properties are the same phase as the mixture. So we could have solid-solid mixtures, but that's a little bit weird because they typically form these crystal structures. So for the most part, for our purposes, we're talking about a liquid-liquid system as a simple mixture. Now you can have you can't have two solids diffusing into one another, and that would count as a simple mixture. But unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to help you on where to begin on that one. Uh, another simple mixture would be two gases mixing together, but again, that one's pretty easy for us to model because we've got relatively accurate equations of state. So for the most part. The challenge is in simple mixtures is liquid-liquid systems for us. Now, non-simple mixtures, these would be vapor-liquid systems. This would be gas-liquid systems. This would be solid-liquid. Or this could be solid-gas. Any system where the pure material 
is not in the same phase as it would be in the mixture. So to illustrate that, <clears throat> let's look at one of these series of approximations here just to get us to a useful discussion and starting point. So for vapor liquid equilibrium, we're going to have the partial fugacity of the liquid has to be equal to the partial fugacity of the vapor. <clears throat> now let's just make a few assumptions here. Let's say it's ideal vapor mixing. I think that's the only assumption we have to make. Now if we assume it's ideal vapor mixing, that means we can use the Lewis Randall rule Oops, no over bar. to approximate the partial fugacity is the mole fraction times by the pure system fugacity, pure component fugacity. Good. Then you transfer that to the liquid side. We have the pure species fugacity. All right, and this is just going to be the product here of basically these two terms. Not saturated, so we're not taking that low pressure approximation here. Activity coefficient, that covers any non-ideal mixing in the liquid phase, and mole fraction, which is oftentimes what we're looking to get here. Who can spot the problem? There is a big problem with this equation. It has to do with the fugacities. And the Gibbs phase rule. So at some temperature and pressure if I have a pure fluid and I've defined the temperature and pressure I have zero degrees of freedom which means I have locked in every property. I've locked in enthalpy, I've locked in volume, I've locked in the phase. So we cannot have we physically cannot have the fugacity of a liquid fluid and the fugacity of a vapor fluid at exactly the same temperature and pressure unless it happens to be at the saturation conditions. But you're never going to have that in a real mixture. Maybe at best one of your compounds will be at a saturation point. The only way that this is possible is if you're saturated. And then these, of course, are equal. So this is why we call them non-simple mixtures. They're not non-simple in terms of the math, they're non-simple in terms of the thermodynamics that's associated with it. So, <clears throat> to demonstrate this a little bit, I have uh, handed out some TXY and PXY diagrams. Who says that TXY and PXY diagrams, who feels confident reading them? Oh, Two, three, four folks, a few. Okay, so most people have seen them though. Who's never seen a TXY or a PXY phase diagram? Okay, so everyone's seen at least a TXY, or PXY phase diagram. Uh, and I'm sure most everyone has seen a phase diagram. And Justin, you're, you're coming at us from metallurgy, so your guys' phase diagrams are very confusing. I can't, I can't handle solid phase diagrams because they have so many lines. Yep. So what we're going to do is we're first going to do a refresh on how to read these things because most of the homework is going to be spent building them and then using them to solve problems. <clears throat> 
and we're going to use it to talk about why vapor liquid equilibrium is a non-simple system. So in the diagram that you have, looks like down here is at about 65. This is for benzene and toluene. And up here, it looks like it's about, uh, was that 90, 98 at the top? <clears throat> Zero, one. And then I like to write Z, meaning the total mole fraction. And we'll see why that's true and I like to do that in the case. And this is for benzene. Now, it is convention that on the x axis you put the most volatile species. Only a convention. There is no rhyme or reason other than it just makes all phase diagrams look a little bit more similar. So in this case, benzene is more volatile than toluene, and we can see that in the phase diagram itself. So let me draw it out. So I've got one anchor point up here, one anchor point down there. I drew it as a solid line, and then we have a dashed line. <clears throat> okay. This is a TXY diagram, which means that our pressure is fixed. And for this particular one here, I think I just fixed it at 101 kilopascals or one atmosphere, just to make it a little bit more simple. So how do I know from this phase diagram that benzene is the more volatile species? The low temperature. It, it boils at a lower temperature. So this temperature right here, this is the saturation temperature <coughs> of pure benzene. Up here, this is the saturation temperature for toluene. Now, if I have a mixture at a low temperature, what phase am I going to be in? Liquid. Liquid. And I'm not joking, every time I look at a phase diagram, I do these checks in my head, because I don't ever remember, like just rote memorization what's going on. I always have to think, okay, high temperature, low temperature. Okay, so that means that this up here is what phase? Vapor. There we go. And this envelope? Liquid and vapor phase. Vapor liquid equilibrium. So it's the two phase region. So, <clears throat> in the phase diagram, if we have a pure species, we'll notice that the two ends of the phase diagram meet at one common point. Because for a pure fluid, the temperature at which a fluid boils and the temperature at which a fluid condenses is exactly the same. For water, it's 100. For benzene, apparently it's about 65. For toluene, about 98. But when you have a multi-component system, you have an envelope of where you can have both liquid and vapor together. And then that composition changes over time. So if I'm going from liquid to the two-phase region, what, what curve is do we call that? Is that the bubble curve? It is the bubble curve. And when we go from a vapor and condense to a liquid, it is the dew curve. So how we can use the, the TXY diagram once it's built. So basically a TXY diagram is solving for every possible theoretical condition of these two fluids mixing together at a fixed pressure. So if I change the pressure, I change the shape of the diagram. Right? But basically, this is a thermodynamic calculation for every set of possible conditions. So if I want to use this diagram to solve a particular problem, right, I have to hold my temperature constant. I have to hold my pressure constant and my total composition constant. And then from here, I can extract out the liquid and the vapor composition. Now, of course, you can kind of work backwards. You can write all sorts of creative problems. But this is the most traditional and conventional analysis. So if I start off with a 50-50 mixture, Right, the bulk, the overall composition is a 50-50. Let's say I prepare it in the lab as a liquid, which makes a lot more sense. Then I can just heat it up, and I can observe how, how the composition changes, or how, which, how much is vapor, how much is liquid. So if I keep the composition constant on this graph, that effectively means that I am drawing a straight line up. Let me get some different colors to highlight this. So if I'm keeping my composition constant, that means that I am drawing a vertical straight line 
as best I can, as I can do. Now, pressure constant, that's already satisfied on this diagram. Temperature being constant, that means I draw a horizontal line. Now, this tells us everything I need to know about the system. This point right here, this tells me my benzene mole fraction in the liquid phase, x. This point right here tells me my benzene composition oops, in the vapor phase, which is y. Now, why did I completely ignore this point for right now? The bubble curve and the dew curve represent the solutions to our partial fugacity equations, meaning that those fluids can only exist under those conditions at this temperature and this pressure. That's what makes two stable fluids, a stable liquid fluid and a stable vapor fluid, is these two endpoints. Now, this point in the middle right here tells us information about how much of each phase we have through the uh, lever rule. Yep. So I view this as a tug of war. That's how I always think about it. Because I can never remember the equation for the lever rule. You can look it up. It's very trivial to look up. But for me, if I get the x and y, it's just easier for me to plug it into a, uh, a material balance to solve for the liquid and vapor, as opposed to me having to remember some esoteric equation that I only use three times a year when I teach this content. So for me, I always just, if I know the x and I know the y, then I can just throw it into a material balance and I can solve for the total amount of each phase. But the distance between these two lines corresponds to how much each phase you have. So the way that I view it is the phase that has more molecules wins the tug of war. So in this case here, do I have more liquid or do I have more vapor from the lever rule? More liquid. And the other way to think about that is, let's say I have a temperature condition right here. Right, where I'm right at the bubble point. Now the bubble point by definition is where I have 100% or 99.99999% liquid and just a teeny, teeny, teeny bit of vapor. So of course they're really dominating that tug of war. Likewise, if I continue to heat the system, I'm starting to boil off material, right? So here I have effectively 100% liquid, a little bit more vapor, a little bit more vapor, even more vapor, more vapor, more vapor, more vapor, until we hit the dew point and we have 100% vapor. So what happens then is the composition of the liquid changes, the composition of the vapor changes, and how much liquid and vapor we have changes. And all of this can be read directly off the TXY diagram. Now the power of TXY and PXY diagrams are not typically going to be for ideal fluid calculations. They're going to be for non-ideal calculations. So if you know the composition of the liquid and vapor, if you just measure flu of them, fit it with an activity coefficient model, then you can basically draw a diagram and solve any conceivable vapor liquid equilibrium scenario you'd like to do so. That could be then put into a process flow simulator, whatever the case is. TXY diagram. Questions? So regardless of how tricky or complex these things look, and they can get very tricky and complex looking, no matter how many pinches or azeotropes or any sort of weird, strange curvature that goes on, no TXY or PXY diagram should be any more complex to read than this. Just figure out either the low or high liquid or vapor. PXY is opposite, right? In a PXY diagram, high pressure is liquid, low pressure is vapor, which means they do in the bubble curve flip. So whichever line touches the liquid phase, that's the bubble curve. Whichever line touches the vapor phase, that's the dew curve. Right, so if I gave you all a non-ideal TXY diagram, I would hope that everyone should be able to read it with just those same basic tenets. Just decode it the same way that I walked through it here, and then we should be all set. All right, so I'm not going to go over the PXY diagram, but it's literally exactly the same. <clears throat> so the problem, though, is that if I have this condition right here, what state of matter does my benzene want to be in? Pure. Pure benzene. What phase does pure benzene want to be in at this temperature? Vapor. Vapor. So the complication here 
is that it's not. Or at least it's partially not. So in this example, is liquid. Pure toluene is, oh, sorry, pure benzene wants to be is a vapor. And pure toluene at this circumstance wants to be a liquid. So the challenge now <clears throat> is that I have to estimate the properties of a fluid that doesn't exist. So I need I need a hypothetical liquid benzene fugacity. And for the toluene case, I need a hypothetical vapor toluene fugacity. And this is where things get a little bit hand wavy, but it seems to work pretty well. So there's two, there's a, basically, what we get down to is this, uh, this concept where all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is where we get into the useful models. So in case A, where we have a, so it's actually a vapor, but we need liquid properties, like in the case of benzene. In this scenario, this is played by the role of benzene. <clears throat> what we can say is that if the pressure is low, then we effectively just say that the fugacity of the pure hypothetical liquid is just going to be approximately the fugacity of the saturated vapor at the same temperature and pressure scenario. Now the best strategy by far is if we have an accurate equation of state we can avoid this whole problem whatsoever and just use the equation of state method to calculate the partial fugacity coefficient. That's also why uh, equations of state are so, zero, so very powerful. So if you ever have to do a high pressure phase equilibrium calculation, but really the only way to do it is, in, is with very, very advanced equations of state. Strategy B, we have actually a liquid. But we need vapor properties played by the role of toluene in our example. We have a couple of options. If the pressure is low, we can just assume it's ideal. In which case, we will just say that the fugacity of a hypothetical vapor is just equal to the system pressure, one perch. We write the fugacity is equal to the pressure times by a fugacity coefficient. And as a reminder, the fugacity coefficient is just the fugacity divided by the pressure. So the other handout that you were provided <coughs> is just such some of these correlations. So of course, we could just directly use an equation of state, which is good. But if you look carefully, let's see, we have on, it depends how you look at it, upside down or right side up, right? <coughs> 
The sideways figure uh, is figure 7.4-1. This is from chapter 7. In chapter 7, that was our single component multiphase system. So in that environment, if you recall way back when we were in chapter 7 of the Sandler book, we were using the Van der Waals equation of state to calculate vapor liquid equilibrium for one component system. So you'll notice that there is a line that's called the saturation line. You'll notice that that saturation line ends at a reduced temperature of 1 and a reduced pressure of 1. So the reduced pressure is just equal to the system pressure divided by the critical pressure. The reduced temperature is just the system temperature divided by the critical temperature. What this chart assumes is that all fluids behave identically based on their deviation from the critical point. In other terms, they say this is the law of corresponding states. Another way to think about this is the law of corresponding states basically says that everything is exactly the same except they have different critical points. So if you relate everything in terms of how close or how far they are from the critical point, then every fluid should condense at the same temperature pressure. Every fluid should have you know, uh, the same deviation from ideal gas behavior at the same temperature and pressure. And that's how these charts are built. So this particular chart is built with the ZC, the critical compressibility factor. So the compressibility factor at the critical point, which is going to be equal to the critical pressure times by the critical specific volume divided by R and the critical temperature. And for this chart, they're saying that all fluids have that number of 0.27. I'm not exactly sure which fluids this exactly applies to, but that's how this chart was, was constructed. Now, not all fluids actually follow this rule, but it's actually a good first order approximation. So. <coughs> If we're doing sort of back of the envelope, non-ideal vapor liquid equilibrium calculations for a pure fluid, we can use this one here. Let's say we're working with some magical component. We maybe know it's vapor pressure at some condition. We can use a generalized chart like this to get an idea of what its critical point is. And then you can take that information and throw it into an equation of state, whatever the case is. Now, if you rotate this and we look at the other figure, this is figure 9.7-1, and that's where we're talking about multi-component, multi-phase systems. This is exactly the same diagram, except it's scaled a little bit differently, so it doesn't look like exactly the same, but there is no saturation line. So what they've done in this bottom figure here is that they have extrapolated uh, from beyond the liquid vapor transition. And so in this case here, let's see, we're trying to if it's actually a liquid but we need the vapor characteristics, that means that all of this stuff down here, right, so if you take a look at this and we draw a representation up on the board, again, this is uh, what I do to convince myself I know what's going on is I have to walk myself through it. So in the, in the one with the liquid vapor transition, I have on the y-axis, the fugacity coefficient. On the x-axis, I have the reduced pressure. I have a saturation line that ends at the critical point. And then I have a series of lines that go like this. And then eventually they kind of pick up again. And I have a series of lines that go like this. Kind of like that. Right, so we can kind of get some understanding that this is a phase transition because the lines kind of have a really sharp kink into it. Now, these lines here are at reduced conditions. So here, this is TR equals 0.8. This one is TR equals, let's say, 1.1, and so on and so forth. And let's say this is TR of 0. Uh, let's say, 75. Trying to grab numbers on here. Okay, so if my reduced temperature or my reduced pressure is above 1, that means I'm super critical. So any of these lines above 1, that means I'm a super critical fluid. So I'm just trying to figure out here, is this liquid or is this liquid? Which of these two is liquid? 
Up here or down there? Which one do we think? Below. Below. So if we take a fluid here, let's say we start off right here, and we pressurize it, meaning that we increase its pressure, so we follow along this line here. If we pressurize a subcritical fluid, eventually it'll condense to a liquid. So up here, this is our vapor. This is super critical. Super critical. And down here is our liquid. So in the case of figure 9.7-1, what they've effectively done is they have ignored this section over here, and they've just continued these lines as if that liquid phase didn't even exist. And as it turns out, it works out reasonably well. And I'm sure if you read the original paper of whoever came up with this idea, I'm sure they had a very stellar reason for why it's theoretically okay-ish. Right? But at the end of the day, the key point here to learn is that we're learning the system right now, and that this is the best system we have to approximate a lot of these properties. Okay. So last thing before we depart, <clears throat> I just want to talk a little bit about uh, gas in liquids. Right, because we have the same exact problem with gases and liquids, same thing with solids and liquids. If I have a gas, that means it's supercritical. If I have a supercritical fluid, the idea of a liquid doesn't even exist. Right? It's supercritical, it can't be a liquid. So if I have a gas in a liquid, I need the partial fugacity of that gas in the liquid phase, which doesn't exist. So instead, what we do is we use something called Henry's Law. H-E-N-R-Y-S, law constant. So what we're saying then is that the partial fugacity of a gas in the liquid state is directly a linear function of what this, fuga this, uh, this uh, Henry's Law constant is. So if I'm looking at the fugacity of a liquid gas as a function of the concentration of that gas, the linear function here represents Henry's Law. And that's what we're basically saying. So instead, what they do to make it a little bit better is they'll often introduce gas and liquid activity coefficients, and they'll call this gamma star greater than 1, gamma star less than 1, as deviations from Henry's law of behavior. This activity coefficient is not at all the same as the activity coefficient we're talking about. It's just a fudge factor for Henry's law. So in this case here, the partial fugacity of a gas in the liquid phase is going to be equal to the mole fraction of the liquid times by this correction factor, which is a function of temperature, pressure, and composition, times by the Henry's Law constant, which is a function of temperature and pressure. And this is a gas in liquid. So for the most part, these laws are developed because they look familiar to other laws that are more rigorously theoretically derived. They do this approach here so that when someone measures the solubility of nitrogen in water or oxygen in water or CO2 in water, what they can do then is instead of having to report a long table of data for every single thing you want to look up, you can instead just publish what the Henry's Law constant is, knowing that everyone who's going to be using the Henry's Law constant should know how to decode what's going on here. But at the end of the day, a lot of these thermodynamic relationships are built and derived so that we can have massive data tables, and every data table isn't just raw data that you have to figure out how to use. So this is just a convention and a sort of a, a cultural approach to condensing a lot of experimental data, right, because these are complex systems, and putting them into more compact forms. So that's a lot of what's going on here with thermodynamics, and that's why a lot of it seems kind of arbitrary, and it's all made up.
It's just the best system that we've come to so far to categorize information. So on Friday, we're going to be talking about how do we actually calculate these do and bubble curves, how do we actually solve some vapor liquid equilibrium problems uh, to get us all ready for the homework itself. All right. See you guys at the symposium tomorrow. <laughs>